just real briefly, um, a little bit about me. I graduated about 21 years ago from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And uh, I was very fortunate to get involved with uh, the Pankey Institute uh, early on, and I took some uh, courses with them. And then not only did I do that, I went back and I started actually uh, practicing what I was taught. And then in 2009, I actually started to get involved with Spear Education. Frank Spear moved his operation down to Scottsdale, Arizona back uh, around 2008, and I got involved with uh, their visiting faculty. And so I've been involved with them since 2009 as one of their visiting faculty and one of their online moderators, as well as one of their online contributors. And then uh, obviously I've been involved with the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry as well. Um, started with them uh, back in, I guess, 05 is when I started going to some of their annual meetings. And I got my accreditation through them in 2017. And I'm also on their Give Back a Smile uh, uh, board, which is their charitable foundation. So, so that's just kind of a brief overview introduction of, of me. And so I've been kind of involved with uh, continued education for, I guess, 12, 14 years now. So first things first, I, I really want to uh, give special thanks to Microdental for not only hosting, but sponsoring uh, tonight's program. So um, and just to let you know, no pictures in the presentation have been altered other than just some global changes such as cropping or exposure. And then uh, I am from North Carolina, so this is not my backyard. This is actually in Banff, Canada. So um, it's a beautiful area if you've never been there. I was there a couple of years ago for the aesthetics um, symposium that we had up there. And um, so I'll do my very best uh, from being from North Carolina with my Southern dialect to not to uh, confuse too many of you. So, but first things first, we'll just kind of jump in and go through this. So, you know, when it comes to cosmetic and aesthetic dentistry, a lot of times uh, we have patients that may come in just like this young lady that came into my practice that uh, had a couple of peg laterals and uh, had some discoloration on one of them. And the other one was just a little bit smaller than what she liked. And she was unhappy with her overall um, smile. And so, you know, in situations like this, it's pretty straightforward from a standpoint of where we could do something that's direct, like a direct resin bonded restoration, or we could do a indirect uh, bonded restoration. And in this case, we, we just did something simple. We did a couple of direct bonded restorations for the patient and she was very happy with the end result. And so for an aesthetic or cosmetic case, it's, it's very straightforward and, and easy case in this situation. But then you have patients that come in like this, that, you know, we wish that cosmetic dentistry was as easy as this, that you have a patient who comes in that has some failing older restorations. He had a couple of veneers, direct veneers or uh, indirect veneers on eight and nine and had uh, a couple of older PFMs on the laterals and a couple of uh, restorations on the, the cuspids and wasn't very happy with his overall smile and the aesthetics of things. And so in that situation, we could simply uh, replace those with some more aesthetic restorations. And, and in that situation, it's very straightforward of removing the old restorations and replacing them with something that's more aesthetic, especially nowadays, now that we have more aesthetic uh, materials such as lithium disilicate and some of the especially more aesthetic zirconies that we have now. So it's a very straightforward case. But not every patient comes in that way. And sometimes we may have patients like this patient who came in that was unhappy with his smile, along with the fact that one of his teeth was also loose in the front. And so, of course, he had a couple of older PFMs, or portion fused to metal restorations on eight and nine from a accident that he had when he was younger. And so as we start to look at his case, we can now see that the patient has a very deep uh, bite and he has almost 100% uh, closure over bite in this situation. And as we do a little more retracted, if we start to look at this situation, we start to see that the patient has some significant wear 
on his lower um, anterior teeth. And so we have to start looking at and thinking about, okay, how does that play into our overall case in the situation like this? So, and then we have this patient who comes in that has um, teeth that she says they're starting to look flat and square and she doesn't like the color of her teeth and she's just unhappy with her overall smile. And as we can see, if we start looking at the incisal edges of her anterior maxillary teeth, we can see that the teeth are worn flat across. And so we have to start thinking about how do we manage or do this particular case. And then on a more extreme situation, we have a gentleman that came into the office that, as you can tell, he has some very significant wear on his teeth. Uh, it's probably worn his teeth down to three to four millimeters in length and almost to a point where he also has an edge to edge bite. And this is not obviously occurred overnight. So this is changed things significantly for him, but he's also concerned about his smile and he wants something that's more aesthetic. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today is how do we manage cases or talk a little bit about some of the basics of the overall anterior guidance and how do we develop the incisal edge position. In other words, we see these cases where patients have significant wear and other issues and where and how do we develop where to put the incisal edge, and how do we develop the anterior guidance. We're also going to take some time this evening and also talk about the different wear patterns that also impact the overall treatment plan and case design for cosmetic cases. And finally, we're going to talk about how all these changes in the incisal edge position, and we start to change the length and shape of the incisal edges and the anterior teeth, how does it affect the overall longevity of the restorations? And I took this picture off to the side that shows kind of a rippling effect. So if any of you have thrown a stone in the water, and I'm sure you have, or jumped in water and seen the rippling effect to it, the purpose behind this is, is that for you to start to think about the fact that when we start to make aesthetic and cosmetic changes to the anterior teeth, it's has a rippling effect, if you will, throughout the rest of the dentition. In other words, how do the other teeth touch? How do they work together? And how does it all kind of flow together? And so when we start making these changes, it kind of has widespread rippling effects to those things, some good and some bad. And so that's kind of what we're going to kind of talk about. So when patients come into our practices, you know, many times um, they don't always come in just looking for, you know, getting their uh, cavities filled or fixing a tooth that's given them pain. They come into our practices looking for changes in the front teeth and they're unhappy with their overall aesthetics and cosmetics. And so one of the most common things we see obviously is poor color. And of course, you know, many times patients talk to us about whitening procedures or getting their teeth bleached, as they say. And so that in itself can be one uh, point of discussion, but also a lot of times patients come in and talk to us about they have some spacing and crowding, or like the one patient I showed where they actually have some peg laterals or smaller teeth, they start to have Bolton's discrepancy or some tooth size discrepancies. And then of course, they have some wear and chipping. All these things can sometimes bring patients to your practice or start discussions with patients that you already have in your practice about, you know, what can be done about this. And of course, the typical things such as disease, obviously decay and tooth loss can cause that. And of course, trauma patients that come in with teeth that have been knocked out or loosened or broken from some type of accident, all these things start the conversation about what can we do about the front teeth. And so really, when it comes to cosmetic and aesthetic dentistry, where do we start on these cases? For cases like the one I showed earlier, where you have a patient who comes in that has a worn smile that's unhappy with their overall color and aesthetics of their teeth, how do we transition the patient over into an, a more aesthetic 
uh, smile that's more youthful and that they're happy with. And so where do we start in this whole process? And for many of us, we had to start thinking about where do we start with inside the ledge position? In other words, where do we put things when it's worn or chipped or broken? And a lot of times patients come into our practices and one of the things that they do is, is that they come in, they talk to us about aesthetic and cosmetic changes. And lo and behold, one of the first things that we like to do is take study models. So we take impressions of their teeth, or in this day and age, we may take digital scans of the teeth. And we may go in so far as, as something as fancy as what I'm showing here, which is mounted models, where you actually take either a centriculation or CR bite and a MI or an MIP bite or maximum intercuspation bite and a face bow, we actually mount it on a semi-adjustable articulator. And what I will say, you know, that's not the end all or be all for these cases, but I will say that your lab would very much appreciate this if you're not doing this because it helps them develop the overall case. And it's a very excellent um, learning tool. But when we have this and we're sitting there staring at this particular case, we have to say, okay, where do we start? Uh, how do I develop this case if this patient is not happy with it? And so many times what we do is we send it off to the lab. And this is what your lab technician is now staring at and going, okay, uh, lab prescription says, please wax up teeth numbers six through 11, return for, you know, diagnostic wax up or, you know, for future and direct restorations. And so there again, when we look at that, it doesn't give the lab technician a whole lot of information. And so when we look at then transition, this is transitioning over to where now, if we take a photo and we have this information here of where we're looking at this particular patient that has you know, this smile, and we can see the overall buccal corridors, we can see how the incisal edge position is to the lower lip. And when we put that beside of these mounted models that gives a lot of powerful information to our lab technicians to start to, the process of communication. And it also helps us from a standpoint of developing a treatment plan. So first and foremost, we have to figure out where we're going to be putting teeth. And that's where we have to start is, is that where do we start when we start looking at this? Do we start with aesthetics? Do we look at phonetics? You know, where the lower lip touches the incisal edges or is it aesthetics alone? So where do we start when we're trying to figure out incisal edge position for, for these patients? So this is a more extreme case when we start looking at this particular patient that has even more wear than the one patient I showed earlier that has very significant wear. And so the question of the day is, is that when we start looking at this patient who has about three to four millimeters of maxillary central incisors on a tooth that's typically 10 to 10 and a half millimeters in length, where do we start? And so, and the first thing is, is that we can think about, you know, do we just simply add to them? In other words, they worn away seven millimeters of tooth. And so let's just send it to the lab and say, hey guys, can you just add seven millimeters of tooth? And of course, that's a lot of porcelain. That's a lot of tooth to look at. Or do we say, well, you know, this looks like th there's not a lot of tooth to work with here. We're gonna have some retention and resistant issues. Maybe we need to send you over to the periodontist or the gum specialist. Maybe we need to do some crown lengthening. Or, you know, or do we maybe even say, wow, you know, these teeth have really moved around and worn down, super erupted. Uh, I'll send you over to the orthodontist. Maybe, maybe he can help me with this case. And we can try to get some of these teeth moved in a different direction before I actually restore it. And so really, it's these photos, if we start looking at this particular picture, which is a lip at rest or a repose picture, when we start looking at this, this starts giving us a whole lot of information. In other words, this is what we see when we're sitting here simply talking to the patient. And so if we look really closely here, we'll see that there's a little bit of incisal edge there. And we can, of course, see 
quite a bit of the lower incisals. And so in a case like that, when we start looking at a full smile, we start looking at a lip at rest, and we start seeing where all these teeth line up to the face and the smile and the lip position, then it starts to help give us a lot better idea of maybe we don't want to lengthen the teeth substantially, and maybe we need to either push the teeth or move the teeth in a different direction, along with either maybe some crown lengthening to help get the final end result that we want. And so it starts to change uh, how we see things. And so first and foremost, one of the most powerful things that I can just stress over and over and over from this lecture, if you're not taking photography, you can't do aesthetic and cosmetic dentistry. You just simply can't do it. And by and far, I will tell you that after doing this for over 20 years and thousands of pictures of later, what I have learned over time is, is that photography is one of the most powerful tools that we use. And it's one of the things that if you want to improve yourself as a clinician, uh, photography is, is one of the best things that you can ever do for yourself as well as patient care. So one of the things I already pointed out, obviously, is getting this full smile, a lip at rest. Those are some really important ones. We also want to get full face smile uh, pictures. We want to get profile pictures. We also want to get pictures of the clusals. We want to get the retracted views. And there's a whole list of ones that we can't get into tonight because of the limited time. But photography is huge. And, of course, videography is, is also a great tool as well. Some of the digital smile design groups, they use videography, and that's very powerful as well because then it's not a static position. We see it in a dynamic position of where the lips and teeth are working together, so to speak, while the patient is smiling and talking and grinning in different angles that kind of gives us some powerful information. The key here is, is that we want to start from the outside in. A lot of times we want to jump right in and start working on teeth, but we want to start from the face and move ourselves in. And at Spear Education, we kind of term that as, as facially generated treatment plan. And so we kind of start with where do we want to put the teeth and how does it fit into the face? And we all learned this, believe it or not, back in dental school. And it comes from dentures because we had our denture patients that came in to uh, our clinics and or our offices now that they don't have any teeth and we have to figure out where we're going to put the teeth. And the first thing we do is, is that we develop a wax rim and then we start setting the maxillary anterior teeth to see where does it fit in the face? What looks nice? What looks aesthetically pleasing? And that becomes the driving part for how do we set up the rest of the dentures? And it's somewhat similar to what we do with teeth is that we have to start thinking about where are we putting the teeth? So let's talk about incisal edges and interior guidance. I mean, basically, when it comes to not only putting the incisal edges where we want it, we also have to start thinking about how those incisal edges work together on the bottom and top. Not only do we want things to look beautiful, but we want it to function well, because when things function well, it's going to last as long. It's going to last a lot longer when they don't. And so... Like I said, we want our patients to not only look good, but we want it to be functional and we want it to last. So what is anterior guidance? So anterior guidance, by definition, it's the most anterior teeth that take the load of guiding the rest of the teeth apart and, and call, calling that posterior disclusion. Now that can be a canine. That's a lot of times what we typically go for in dentistry is canine guidance. It could be the first premolar. It could be the second premolar. We could be guiding off the first molar. That could be the most anterior tooth, and that's what's providing the anterior guidance. It may not be ideal, but that's what we call anterior guidance when the most anterior tooth pushes the back teeth apart. And ideally, like I said, we want the anterior teeth or the incisors to help guide the posterior teeth apart. As we call it, kind of the anterior teeth are kind of the guiders of the posterior teeth. So why is this important? The reason why it's important, well, first and foremost, it's important when we start to see where. And, you know, the other thing that we have to think about is, is that when anterior teeth help guide posterior teeth apart, 
a study that was done almost 30 years ago by Williamson Lundquist showed that actually the overall elevator muscle activity actually goes down. So what that means is, is that these patients that are generating a lot of force that may be causing wear on teeth when they're going into lateral movements or protrusive movements or lateral protrusive movements and the anterior teeth push the back teeth apart, the elevator muscle goes down, the activity goes down, and as it goes down, the forces go down. And so thus, in turn, we're decreasing the stress and strain on the teeth. In a perfect world, we'd love to have patients that came in like the first one that just had a couple of peg laterals that needed some work done that has absolutely no wear. If you look at her front teeth, she has no wear at all. But many times our patients come in, they have a little bit of wear on their teeth. This patient has a little bit of wear on the, the anteriors that I kind of marked here. And then you have some patients that come in with a little bit more wear where they've actually worn significantly into the lateral and into the centrals. And then we have patients like I showed earlier that has a lot of wear. And so, you know, in those cases, things get a lot more complicated as far as how we manage it. And so we're going to kind of talk about basically what I kind of term as two different wear patterns to start off with. It first starts off with what I call micro wear. In other words, you start to see the trees. In other words, in the forest, we see teeth that are worn. You may see one or two teeth that are worn. Maybe it's just the cuspids. Maybe it's just the central incisors. And you don't really see anything else that's worn. Or it could be a posterior tooth. That's what I would call as just tooth wear. And then we start to see what I call macro wear, which is kind of the forest. In other words, we basically get wear on all the dentition. In other words, most or if not all the dentition is worn. And so tooth wear kind of precedes the more generalized wear. In other words, as the teeth start to wear down one tooth, if you have say a cuspid wearing against the cuspid, then it wears down and then the lateral starts to wear or the central starts to wear and then the back teeth start to wear more. And then next thing you know, you've got a generalized wear pattern. So a lot of times we will start to recognize in our practices tooth wear way before we start to see the more generalized wear patterns. So it's something to just kind of pay attention to in your practice as you're restoring these patients. So we're going to talk about three common types of tooth wear patterns that we see, uh, especially in the anterior teeth. The first one we're going to talk about is edge to edge wear or what we call end on end wear. So basically, we don't really see any wear on the front or the lingual side of the teeth. In other words, we don't see any on the lingual aspect of the maxillary anterior teeth or any wear on the lower incisors on the facial aspect. We almost exclusively see it on the incisal edges. And so when that patient jumps out there, what they literally do is they go from a MIP bite where they're teeth are together in the back and they move it forward and they rest on their anterior teeth and that's where they so to speak live they wear their teeth down over time this is a good example of where we see just basically wear and cupping on the anterior teeth alone and we don't see really anything much past the anterior teeth because that's where essentially where they live at they go out there on the edges we don't see any wear on the anterior part of it or on the facial aspect or the lingual aspect, we see primarily it's just on the incisal edge. And so when we see these patients in our practices, how do we manage these patients? So first and foremost, we have to ensure that the upper and lower incisal edges fit together. In other words, when we're going to go and restore these patients, we want to make sure that those edges fit together. And we want to make sure that we want to share the load. We don't want to make sure we, we want to make sure it's not just on one tooth. One of the most common things that we do in these situations is, is that we focus primarily on the maxillary anterior teeth because patients come in and they're not happy with their anterior teeth on the top and they're less concerned about their lower teeth. But unfortunately, those teeth have worn as well. And so what ends up happening is, is that sometimes if you've got a tooth that's super erupted or it's worn or chipped, and we try to put that up against our new restorations and, and they're putting their teeth out here edge to edge, then it's going to lead to something chipping or cracking or failure. 
And of course, I put on here, use what you learn. In other words, patients have shown you, whether it's in this wear pattern or any of these wear patterns I'm going to show you, they've shown you what they're going to do with their teeth. It's a habit that they have developed, whether it's during their sleep, whether it's during the day, whatever it may be, they are showing you what they do with their teeth. And so you have to kind of, so to speak, listen to it because if they destroyed what mother nature put there, they're going to destroy what you put there unless you manage it properly. And in these end-to-end -end or edge-to-edge -edge patients, we also have to start thinking about airway issues because these are patients that when they have breathing difficulties or they can't breathe well through their airway because it's constricted, a lot of times patients will move their jaw out edge-to-edge -edge and they rest out there because it allows them to breathe better. So we won't get into that. It's a whole other discussion, but just some things to think about. So this is just a quick, simple diagram of you may get those perfect front teeth, get everything lined up, and you may have that one lower central incisor that's sticking up or worn uh, off to the edge. And it's better to just kind of level that out, make sure that basically when that patient goes out edge to edge, that it's a nice smooth transition where they're resting out there. They have a nice surface for them to rest on. And that's for edge to edge. The next wear pattern we're going to talk about is what we call crossover wear pattern. So in these patients, what we will see is actually we'll start to see some wear on the lingual surfaces of the lower anterior teeth. And this is in class one, class two occlusions, because class three, as we know, basically those patients will already have potentially some wear on the lower uh, anteriors on the lingual surface, but just because of how their teeth fit together. And we'll sometimes see the wear on the facial surfaces of the uppers. And basically, whether it's in this particular pattern or the next pattern that we'll talk about, sometimes it's in combination with other wear patterns that we see with these patients. And so crossover wear patterns in this situation, what we see is, is that these patients go down and forward, and then they actually go all the way out edge to edge, and then they cross over and to pass where the edges actually meet. And so we see that, and that's where we start to see where in these unusual areas, such as on the lingual aspects of the lower anteriors or the facial aspects of the maxillary anterior teeth. And so this is a good case. Here, if we look at the lower anteriors, we see some incisal wear patterns. But when we really start looking, really closely on the lower anteriors, we'll actually see that the lingual aspect of those lower anteriors are actually worn. And that's where that patient is actually going all the way over into crossover and wearing the lingual aspect of those teeth as well. How do we manage these? Well, it's really somewhat simple from a standpoint of what we wanna make sure is that the tooth transition is smooth coming and going. In other words, these patients go all the way out to edge to edge positions, whether it's all the way out to the very edge of the cuspids or the maxillary anterior teeth, and then they go beyond that. And then they come back. And so we wanna make sure that as they go out there and come back, that it's smooth. And so the key there is making sure that the pitch and bevel is, is smooth. And we'll kind of talk a little bit about what pitch and bevel is. So basically pitch and bevel is, is that the pitch is referring to the very edge of the tooth. In other words, it's the actual incisal edge of the lower anteriors or the upper maxillary anterior teeth. The bevel is basically the slope or the angulation past that. And so when those teeth go out there, we want it to kind of be smooth. This particular patient actually has some significant uh, crossover components and so when we watch this patient actually go out all the way out edge to edge and then she goes out past it she smoothly transitions over onto her centrals and so if we kind of see that she literally has basically ground in her own pitch and bevel if you will to make it nice and smooth and if you look kind of closely you can kind of see where at one point where these lower anterior teeth were a little bit more uh, prominent, the facial aspects of some of these teeth actually had a little bit of wear on the facial surfaces of it. The last wear pattern that we're going to talk about is pathway wear or what some people term as restricted envelope of function. 
And we see this a lot in patients uh, where they basically are wearing the facial surfaces of their lower anterior teeth and the lingual surfaces of the upper maxillary anterior teeth. And what happens is, is that these patients literally are going up and down, up and down. And as they do that, they completely wear the facial surfaces of the lower anteriors and the lingual surfaces of the maxillary anterior teeth to a point where the teeth not only super erupt, but then uh, they, they're literally touching together and, and they wears into the uh, significant part of the tooth. So this is a, a lower uh, anterior teeth that we can see here that also has you know some pathway where if we look at the facial surfaces of these lower anterior teeth, we can see these flattened patterns of where this is worn. But we also see where this patient also has some other components of crossover wear where they're going out and crossing over wearing the different edges of the teeth as well as the facial surfaces. And here again, as I mentioned earlier, these wear patterns, sometimes patients have a combination. It's not just one wear pattern. And this is another case where we look at the facial aspects of the lower anteriors, we can see some significant wear, uh, pathway wear as we would term that, or some people call it restricted envelope of function. Some people call it restricted envelope of function because patients or people believe that it's kind of partially because they're restricted as far as how they're chewing or eating or moving their jaw. And that's, that's what causes the wear on the facial surfaces of the lower anteriors and the lingual surfaces of the anteriors. So ultimately what happens over time is, is that we look to the far left on this diagram is, is that as those teeth wear together, then they super erupt and they're still in full contact. In order to try to restore these situations, we have to restore the lingual aspect of the upper as well as the facial aspect of the lower anteriors. And so that kind of brings the question, how do we do this? And so one of the things is, is that here again, this goes back to learning what the patient has already taught you. And that's basically using a custom and size or guide table. This is something that if you don't use or not familiar with, I'm sure your lab can be happy to kind of talk to you about this. And of course, I'll share my email at the end and be happy to share any information with uh, this or any part of the uh, presentation. But basically, a custom and size of guide table is we can actually reproduce those movements that that patient is going through. And so when it comes time for us to restore these teeth, we can kind of not restrict them any further or change that in a significant or negative manner. Because... The thing is, is that what we have to understand is, is that in pathway wear management, in order to actually restore these teeth, we actually have to have room on the lingual aspect of the maxillary anterior teeth. If we look over here to the far left in the green, if we tried to just simply just prep that tooth to just kind of give us enough room, you'll see that we would remove quite a bit of the tooth because there's already a lot of the tooth that's already missing. So a lot of times this requires us to get teeth in a better position. A lot of times we need to either move the lower anterior teeth or the upper anterior teeth or both to kind of create some room, <clears throat> or we end up having to open the bite on the patient in order to kind of create enough restorative room for this patient so we can restore the lower anterior teeth to proper contour and shape and to restore the maxillary anterior teeth, the proper shape and function. So the other thing that we want to talk about is, is that as we're going through this and we start seeing wear and edges on teeth, we have to start thinking about how does this change the overall uh, tooth length if we start adding change in lengths. So one of the things that we have to think about is, is that when we start changing the overall anterior guidance and we start taking these war, worn dentitions, the first thing that happens is, is that we start adding length. And so when that happens is, is that we're actually increasing the overjet and overbite to a degree to where now we're kind of steeping in the guidance. And that can be helpful for moving the teeth apart, but we're also going to be adding some uh, stress and strain to the teeth in the system. And with that being said is, is that 
we have to think about how to manage that because when we start simply adding it, we, like I said, we increase the ever bite and we deepen the bite further. And then in patients that have a horizontal wear pattern or cheap patterns, we then are actually going to restrict them and that can make that situation worse. And so, and there again, the only way to correct these is it's through either changing the tooth position or opening the vertical. And so as we start to look at that, as if we simply just try to change or open the bite, one of the things that we have to think about in um, opening bite cases and these cases where we have significant wear for patients is, is that when we start to open bites, the lower interiors and the lower mandible doesn't go straight down, but it actually auto rotates down and back. And so as we start to open the vertical, not only do we increase or decrease the overbite, we also start to increase the, the overjet. And so now trying to get anterior coupling becomes more and more challenging. So this is one of the things that we don't have time to talk about tonight, unfortunately, but it's one of those things that you have to consider when you start talking about opening bite options versus doing orthodontics and other options to manage wear cases. And of course, like I said, sometimes the best thing is for us to just simply correct the tooth position for patients. Because then we can just simply move the teeth where they need to be and then restore them. And then we have the, the proper uh, overjet and overbite uh, to manage the patient going forward. So the other thing that we have to think about too, when we start changing the, the overall length of it, we also are starting to change the overall steepness of your guidance. And of course, like I said, that moves the teeth uh, in the back uh, quicker. In other words, we uh, have quicker posterior disclusion, but we also start to increase the overall stress and strain to the other teeth. And so just something to kind of think about is, is that as we start to increase the angulation of disclusion or the steepness by simply 10%, there's a 30% lateral load increase. And of course, this becomes really important in patients where we're starting to talk about implant prosthesis, but obviously we're putting a lot of stress and strain on the teeth as well. So we're going to jump over into the macro wear patterns to kind of start to finish things out. Um, so we're going to talk about the different ones. And so basically you, it's pretty simple when we start talking about macro or generalized wear patterns, we either got wear on the front teeth, the back teeth, or both. And so that means we either got segmental wear patterns or generalized wear patterns. And so when we have these cases where we have, um, more wear on the anterior teeth, then typically this is kind of what you see is, is that you start to see wear on the anterior teeth. And then a lot of times there, again, we don't see um, space in between the anterior teeth. Those teeth typically will super erupt over time and they stay in contact. And so how do we manage cases like this, where we've got, you know, wear in the anterior teeth and we've got super eruption. Like in this case here, if we start to look at this segmental wear case, if we start looking at the gingival margins, that's usually kind of gives us some pretty good insight to what's happening in this patient as we kind of start to see how the anterior teeth are stepped up on the lower interiors because of the wear. So the best option for these teeth really is just to kind of put them back to where they are and then restore them. And of course, if you need to do some crown length, then depends on the extent of it. Just like that one case I showed earlier, it would be as simple as basically send the patient to the orthodontist, or if you feel comfortable managing it through Invisalign or some other uh, orthodontic treatment of where you basically intrude, remove those teeth back to where they were originally. And it makes really the case at this point, very simple because now you have restorative room and then basically you either do uh, direct bonded restorations, or you can do some indirect uh, ceramics, and then you restore the teeth, and, and basically you've now kind of restored that patient back to function. The other segmental wear patterns that we run into is, is that we start to get more wear on the posterior teeth and the anterior teeth, and here again, one of the things that we run into is those posterior teeth start to wear, we don't have this wide open gap in the posterior to where 
it would be as simple to restore it. A lot of times those teeth, there again, they tend to super erupt over time and then they come into contact. Here again, one of the most common things that there again, to manage it, the best thing to do is actually push the teeth back into place where they actually belong. And then we actually do some crown lengthening if we need to, uh, if there's not enough tooth for resistance or retention form. And then we restore the posterior teeth. Now, sometimes uh, we can't always do that. And patients may not be so excited about doing orthodontic treatment for say wear on the posterior teeth. And so we can always look at open and vertical because if these posterior teeth are already worn and short, it makes it really hard and challenging for us to uh, rebuild those teeth. And so we can add to them, but then what ends up happening is, is that then we start to lose anterior coupling and then the anterior teeth are no longer touching. So what determines that is how the anterior teeth look aesthetically. In other words, as we start to open the posterior teeth and give us some restorative room in the posterior, then we start to open the anterior bite and then we have to correct the anterior teeth in order to kind of get anterior coupling so the anterior teeth becomes the driving factor if you will as far as how far can we do that and of course sometimes you have these patients that have generalized wear throughout the dentition in other words they've worn the front and the back teeth and there again these teeth will typically erupt over time, just like one of the cases that I showed you earlier that all the teeth were worn and they will erupt and they come in full contact. And so how do you manage these patients? Well, opening the vertical is a very reasonable option, but here again, the determining factor for how much can we open the vertical dimension is determined on the anterior teeth. In other words, where do we put the anterior teeth? And then that then determines how do we restore the posterior teeth from there. And then this is just kind of showing a diagram of how you restore the anterior teeth in the proper position to where they're aesthetically and functionally uh, correct. And then you then uh, have your lab, or in this case, you would restore that to the final dimensions that you would want vertically. So ultimately, when we kind of start thinking about all this, as I kind of start wrapping things up, is, is that we have to start thinking about the overall importance of the incisal edges and positions and length and shape. Because like I mentioned earlier about the little drop in the water and how it shows kind of a rippling effect, what we have to think about is, is that, like I said, as we start to make changes in these incisal edge positions, the shape, we start to impact not only the smile, but we also impact the overall functional components. And so we have to start thinking about that from that standpoint. And so we have to think about how that's gonna impact um, the overall, uh, sorry, I'm having a little audio visual difficulty here. Sorry, a little stall. Uh, but anyhow, so it, as we start to change the overall edges and functions with one another and a patient with where it can kind of lead to premature failure. And so this is just a quick case to kind of go through. This is a patient that had some wear on the anterior teeth. And basically, as you can tell, she had some edge to edge. She had some crossover wear in this particular case. And I'm just going to kind of go through these slides of showing the preoperative pictures. This is kind of a right lateral and then left lateral. We kind of see the different edge positions of where these different edges have kind of worn over time in this particular patient. And then this is a protrusive. As you can see, uh, those edges don't line up. And that's where they're going into uh, crossovers. A lot of times we see this inverted V, if you will, in these anterior teeth. This is the restored smile with uh, some ceramics. And as we kind of go back through and recheck things, we start to see that lo and behold, uh, ceramics was really close, but not exactly where we needed it to be. And so we went through and we started doing protrusive markings in this particular patient. Obviously, we liked where the incisal edges were, so we made some changes to the lower incisors. 
And as we started to make some adjustments, as you can see in a protrusive movement, we can see that they're now kind of in full contact. We wanna make sure that this patient we know that goes into crossover, we wanna make sure that they go over into a nice smooth crossover from their cuspids onto their centrals and then back to where it's nice and smooth that there's no hangups in the pitch or bevel as they kind of go across. And so that's kind of how we kind of ended up finishing this out. I want to kind of give special thanks to Frank Spear. Some of you may or may not know Frank, but uh, Frank's been a mentor of mine for some time. Uh, he was very uh, nice to share some of the uh, slides that I kind of shared with you this evening. Uh, he was allowed me to um, use his slides. Uh, I always try to give him uh, credit where credit is due for this. And so that is pretty much what we had. I try to wrap this up in about 50 minutes to kind of give us a little bit of time for Q and A. And I think we're pretty much about on time there, Gabriel. Mux, uh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. No worries. Absolutely, Dr. Langberry, you're on time. Thank you so much for your insight and for your presentation. Uh, please make sure that you stay for the duration of the webinar to have your CD credit recorded. We're going to be beginning our question and answer segment for the webinar. If you have any questions and you do not have a microphone, please just type out your questions and we'll have them presented for you. If not, please use the raise your hand feature and we'll select on you and we'll make sure that your answer is heard. Uh, I see so, one question on there, Max. So to begin, um, we have Dr. Ramirez. Uh, he's asking for uh, prep design on the last case. Um, were we using veneers or full preps? Uh, on that particular case, it was actually full prep uh, because uh, in that particular one, we were trying to not only manage the incisal edge, but we, was also, we were also trying to manage the overall anterior guidance because that particular patient uh, had some wear on the lingual aspects. So that, that was what we did on that particular case. Okay, um, another question that we had, uh, when it comes to wear cases, uh, what have you learned overall? Uh, well, one of the, the huge things I've learned from wear cases is, is that really uh, the patient's wear patterns are huge. In other words, kind of like I mentioned early on in the, the webinar, uh, the patients are teaching you a lot from what you see. In other words, the wear patterns that you see, whether they're edge to edge or they are a, a crossover wear patterns, or if they have a uh, functional issue from a standpoint of where uh, they have a restricted envelope of function or those things are what I call basically clues. In other words, what I've learned from wear cases is, is that uh, patients that have pathological wear issues, um, I learned so much from what the patients have already done with their teeth and I look at those as clues, if you will. In other words, clues for what's happening and what's going on and how do I design and how do I work with this patient going forward based off of their history. Okay. Um, another question that we have uh, from Dr. Ramirez again. Um, what type of night guard do you recommend for these types of wear with loss of interior guidance? Do you fabricate a post-treatment night guard with interior guidance ramps or just use a flat plane in general? So, uh, well, that's kind of a, I guess, a more complex question. It, it is very case dependent, so to speak. But what I will say is, is that probably predominantly I do use a flat plane appliance on most of my patients to develop proper uh, occlusion and anterior guidance. And a lot of times when it comes down to it, uh, I may take some of these patients and actually I will do that prior to treatment. And part of that is, is for a couple of reasons. One, it helps me understand what the patient is doing. Two, many times we find that patients don't walk into our offices and say, you know what, doc, I grind my teeth. 
I have wear on my teeth. I know that I have a problem. Many times when we talk to patients about wear and uh, parafunctional habits, many times patients will uh, deny it, say, I, I don't grind my teeth. I, I don't do that. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And so a lot of times wearing appliance uh, pre-treatment can be very helpful for that as well, because not only do you learn about what the patient's doing, but also uh, the patient starts to understand the dynamics of what it is that you're doing. Okay, thank you for your answer, doctor. Um, another question coming in from the chat. How do you treat the first case with a collapsed bite? How do we treat the patient with a collapsed bite? Well, so there again, what you have to do is, is that first and foremost, you have to kind of figure out the etiology of, of what's going on. That particular case, that patient actually had some uh, sleep-induced bruxism. So that patient actually had some sleep apnea. So once we had that under management, then uh, that was a much more easier case to manage. But then once um, I was able to get that under control, then once I figured out where to put the incisal edges, then uh, then I did a diagnostic wax up and then we rebuilt the case from, from that piece of it, of developing the same thing. Where do we put the incisal edges? Then once we have the maxillary interior teeth where we want them to be, to be aesthetically, then we kind of rebuild the bite around that. Okay, another question coming in in the chat as well too. Hi, I have case, the interior guidance PT, and I'm trying to translate as much as I can. I'm trying to make six veneers. She broke my temp twice already. Should I change to CRs or keep veneers with Invisalign in Texas? So I'm not quite, I, I kind of heard bits and pieces of what you were asking. So it sounds like to me, they are in um, a situation of where they have teeth that are provisionalized and the patient's already broken the temporaries a couple of times. Is that what I'm understanding? Um, let me run the question back one more time as well, too. And I'll also send a message to the doctor that asked this in the chat. Um, but we have a case of interior guidance, um, PT, and she's trying to make six veneers. Um, she broke the temp twice already. So mm -hmm. she's trying to see if she should change to CRs or keep the veneers with Invisalign. So the thing about it is, is that one of the most common things I, I'm here in ZR, I'm going to say zirconia. I want to change things over to zirconia. I'm guessing that's what they're saying. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure if that's kind of the question, but my, my general thought process is, is that when it comes to patients that are breaking your temporaries, then the question is, is why? And so you have to figure out, what is the patient doing from a parafunctional habit? What is it that you're missing? In other words, is it a crossover wear pattern? In other words, maybe they're going out into an extreme crossover position that's causing them to, to break it. Obviously, they could have a terrible habit such as, you know, biting on their, you know, chewing on a pencil or, you know, uh, something like that. But if they're doing something that's parafunctional where they're grinding on their teeth, and a lot of times then what ends up happening is they're going into certain positions that's causing uh, those temporaries to break. So a lot of times what I would do in that situation is, is that I may look closer at my diagnostic wax up and, you know, sit down with mounted models and then have that patient go into protrusive, lateral protrusive and different movements and see where is it that they're catching? Because a lot of times where they're breaking things, that's where they're catching things. In other words, it's not a smooth transition. Okay, sounds good. Dr. Shirakura, if you have another question um, for a follow-up, please just let me know and I will send that out as well too. Um, moving on to the next question from an anonymous attendee. If doing veneer preps or when doing veneer preps, where do you try to get the contacts to be on the rest on the resto R E S T O on the natural tooth or away from the margins of resto. Well, uh, typically I like to have my veneer preps on uh, natural tooth if all possible, and uh, determine whether or not I'm going to break contact or not. Uh, it all depends on the overall functional and aesthetic final restoration. In other words, what I'm looking for. 
if patients per se, if they have, for instance, spacing between their teeth, then we have to take the, the veneer preps in approximately in order to uh, develop proper profile, emergence profile, in, in order to kind of give an aesthetic result. So. Okay, moving on to the next question. When you have anterior teeth, where, and you should choose to open the bite to make room because the patient refuses orthopedics, in order to get the maxillary teeth to couple, do you just over contour the lingual's or the maxillary interiors to get them to couple? Uh, I mean, sometimes we may add some to the lower or to the um, lingual aspect of the maxillary teeth. Uh, and it also depends on what the lower anterior teeth are. There again, they kind of work hand in hand. So if you have a situation where the lower anterior teeth are worn, then I may, if the patient is refusing doing more extensive treatment on those teeth, then I may do direct bonded restorations to create proper uh, function where those teeth are, are working in, uh, along with the maxillary anterior teeth to help develop proper anterior guidance. Okay, circling back to the question from Dr. Shirakura uh, regarding the temps. Another question is, should you make them with the Emacs or with zirconia? Uh, was it in reference to veneers? Is that what I heard? Yes, in reference yes. to the veneer question. Yes, I mean, so I will say historically, I mean, I, I would definitely there, I would do lithium disilicate or Emacs type restorations. One, uh, bondability and predictability uh, in my hands is very predictable to bond that type of ceramic uh, to tooth. Two, as I mentioned before, a lot of times, you know, when we have um, patients that are fracturing provisionals, uh, if we go and we simply try to make the restoration stronger and stronger and stronger by, you know, going from lithium to silicate to zirconia to a different harder material, uh, that patient is still gonna have a functional habit and eventually, there will be a weak length, whether it's the porcelain, whether it's the bond interface, whether it's the cement interface, whether it's the root, something will fail. So it's important to try to sort out, you know, what kind of functional habits or issues is going on that's causing these issues. Okay. Um, another question coming in from Dr. Orson. Do you tend to recommend limited or full ortho with severe wear pattern cases? Uh, typically, I mean, most of those patients, they end up being full ortho cases. I mean, it depends on the case. In other words, if it's a case that we may end up doing limited ortho to help facilitate a better full restoration, then that's what we would do in cases of where we can do full orthodontics and say that uh, we can move teeth versus uh, as we say uh, with my orthodontist, we can either move enamel or we can remove enamel. So if we can treat the case in a more uh, conservative manner and move teeth around and have to restore less teeth, then that's our ideal goal in those cases. Okay, another question coming in from the chat. With sleep apnea case, how do you go about it? I believe this question. So sleep apnea cases, uh, I guess in a nutshell, typically in patients that I feel like that they have a sleep apnea uh, condition, then we usually get those referred over to the sleep specialist first and foremost for diagnosis. And then once we have a diagnosis, are they mild, moderate, severe? Then we can kind of start to determine that piece of it. And then are they getting treatment for that? And then once we have that piece of the puzzle that's getting managed, then uh, some of those patients we may put into a temporary provisional or something where uh, as far as they can wear at night to see if they're still grinding because some patients that are nighttime bruxers and they have sleep apneic issues, uh, when you treat the apneic uh, condition, then what we will see is the overall functional issues or habits that we have at night actually diminish greatly or go away altogether. So that can significantly help improve your overall case. 
Okay, and a follow-up question from the same doctor. Do you uh, treat the sleep apnea first and then treat the function itself? Absolutely. Yeah, we always want to treat the sleep apnea because it's a medical condition. So, you know, bottom line, you know, we all love teeth, but, you know, bottom line, patients have to be able to breathe. And, mm -hmm. you know, sleep apnea is a medical condition that needs to be treated and managed. And so unless that patient's in pain or discomfort, then, you know, we get, we get the sleep apnea stuff under control. And then we do what I call, you know, uh, disease management. You know, if they've got some periodontal disease or some caries or decay, things like that, we'll get the patient stable uh, during their uh, uh, beginnings of their sleep apnea condition. And then once their sleep apnea is under control, then, then, then you, you can kind of proceed with more comprehensive treatment.